If you have your Bible, open up to Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at the last church in our series of uh, the first few chapters of Revelation. And uh, this church, the letter to the church of Laodicea, has grown to be personally one of my favorites. Um, not because of the example the church gives, because as we'll see, this was arguably one of the worst churches uh, that was to receive a letter of Revelation, but because of who we see Jesus is and what he offers to the church in this passage. And so what we're going to see this morning is the problem laid out before the church in Laodicea, and we're also going to see that, as I said, it's one of the worst churches, and if we were to think to the other churches, and even the church of Sardis, which was in quite a dismal situation, uh, at least it was noted to them they had a few faithful names. There's no such things listed here for Laodicea. What we also see is that though there is a dire situation taking place in this uh, verse, in this passage of Revelation for Laodicea, we see the solution that Christ has offered to the church. And it is surprisingly simple. It's simple, but it is all-encompassing. It is beautiful and it's amazing because it is simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is simply knowing and trusting in him. And so if you are able, I invite you to please stand this morning for the reading of the word of our Lord. I would remind us that what we have before us is the inerrant and the infallible word of God. That everything contained within these pages is good and profitable for all things pertaining to life and godliness. And as I conclude reading, I'll declare this is the word of the Lord. If you agree with that, please respond with thanks be to God. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, says this. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have, pos I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. May it be ever present on our hearts this morning. May we not miss what you are saying, not only to the church of Laodicea, but may, you also, may we also not miss what you're saying to us as a local body and us as individuals. Lord, change us and renew us if, if you must. Build us up and strengthen us in you and help us to draw near to you. Heavenly Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In order to begin to understand what Jesus is saying to the church of Laodicea, we have to understand Laodicea itself. There's a few things that will help us grasp the words of Jesus. And uh, first and foremost is that Laodicea was situated at the intersection of three major highways and trade routes. And because of where it was located, and because of its production, the things that it created, the, the soft black wool, the salve for eyes that were supposedly medication to help those with weak eyes, and because of all of the, the, bank, the bankers and the financial institutions within Laodicea, what we have is a city that was immensely wealthy. They were so wealthy that when an earthquake had struck Asia, Asia Minor, the city actually refused aid from the government because they didn't have the need for it. They had an abundance of riches. They had an abundance of material possessions, an abundance of finances. There was nothing that they needed from a material perspective. They were self-sustaining and self-reliant. The downside of Laodicea is that it had no source of water in and of itself. And so it had to rely on its neighbors. And if you see, I know it can be difficult, but we have Laodicea outlined on the map. To the north, we have a city called um, uh, 
Hierapolis. And in Hierapolis, they had an abundance of hot springs, which provided hot water. To the south, we had Colossae, and Colossae had access to cold water. And in these two cities, because they had access to water and Laodicea did not, that water had to be piped into Laodicea. And by the time it arrived, it was lukewarm and dirty. And so with these words in mind, understanding the context of Laodicea, that it's immense wealth and it's lukewarm water that it had access to from other cities, is the lens through which we can begin to understand the words of Jesus Christ and how he addresses the church. So if you have your Bible still open, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 says this. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And I want to begin by looking at Christ. And I know that we have seen him address these churches over and over again. And he always has this brief introduction about himself and how it relates to the churches that he's speaking to. But I want to spend a moment, a moment this morning because what we see Jesus communicating about himself, first and foremost, is that he is the Amen. And there is times where maybe you have not understood or have not remembered the weight of what the word Amen means. Because we say it all the time after our prayers. And maybe it's just this robotic or, or habitual thing that we say, Amen. But the word Amen means, so let it be. It means firm, truly, Surely, may it be fulfilled. It is, a, it is a phrase or a word that communicates the idea of absolute trust and confidence. So when we say amen, we are laying our prayers before the Lord with trust and absolute confidence in the God whom we are praying to. Amen. And when Jesus says that he is the amen, he is the only source of confidence that we should ever truly put everything into. He is the, the fulfillment of what is true. His word is true. If Jesus has said it, then we can count on it. There's nothing else that is, that is as rock solid as the word of God. And when he communicates himself as the amen, the firm, the truly, the surely, the source of absolute tr uh, trust and confidence. He's saying that when he speaks and what he says in this letter, these words are true. And he has to begin with this because this church has put on a facade. This church has put on a face and claiming that they're pop prosperous, but when in reality they aren't. They're spiritually bankrupt. He goes on to speak of himself as the faithful and true witness, even further reinforcing the fact that he is the amen. That he speaks, and what he speaks is faithful, and it is true, and we can always trust on it and rely on it. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has, given him, has, has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, long ago and many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The words of the Son, the words of Jesus Christ, are the words of God. And so when Jesus comes to this church, he brings this letter to the church, he's saying, listen, you need to wake up, because what I'm saying is true. You can try to hide it, you can try to lie to yourself, you can try to put a facade up, put on a mask, you can try to trust in the things you've been trusting in, but hear the words of the Amen. Church, we need to hear the words of the Amen. We need to hear the words of God. We need to be honest with ourselves. Is, are the things that Jesus is saying this morning to the church in Laodicea, does it in any way impact you? Does it weigh on you in any way? Is there any relation, any kernel of truth about what Jesus says about them that can be said about you? And if that's the case, then hear the solution the Lord has to offer. When we move into the accusations the Lord brings in verses 15 and 16, he first says this, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would you that you were either cold or hot? 
So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We need to understand first that what this verse is not saying. Because for a while when I was younger in my faith, I thought that this meant you either need to be on fire for Jesus or you need to be cold for Jesus. You shouldn't be a fence sitter. You shouldn't, shouldn't be sitting in the middle. But the reality is, is that in the midst of the context, the hot water that is referred to from Hierapolis was useful for medical benefits and for cooking. Hot water was useful. The cold water from Colossium was thought to have health benefits and was good to drink. Again, also useful. Hot water is useful, the cold water was useful, but lukewarm water was useless. Lukewarm water did nothing. It just sat there. And like the useless, lukewarm water that Colossae was all too, all too familiar with, the Lord says, you also, Colossae, are useless. You have no benefit to the kingdom. You are unconcerned with acts of mercy. You are unconcerned with witnessing and sharing Christ. You are unconcerned with focusing on Jesus and making much of him. You have no concern for those things. You simply trust in what you have, your material possessions. You simply trust in worthless, useless things. And because of that, your kingdom impact is nothing. In fact, why would the church rely on Jesus when they had everything they could possibly need? They had riches. They had resources. They had homes. They had everything they could possibly want. Why Jesus? We get to verse 17, and Jesus says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. <coughs> Christ has measured the church. Because the church had measured themselves. They said, look at how great we are, look at how prosperous we are. Look at how many of us they are. Look at all the, the possessions and the things. The Lord has surely blessed us. We have an abundance. The Lord is with us. Yet, by their measurement, they maybe appeared like they were doing well, but on the inside, the Lord who has the eyes like flames of fire, the Lord who sees, the Lord who speaks faithfully, he looks upon this church and he says, No, you have not prospered. You are not doing well. You have no self-awareness. In fact, your situation is incredibly dire. You're not rich. You're wretched and pitiful. You're not prosperous. You're poor. You're not self-reliant. You're blind and naked. He lays these things at the, at the feet of the church, helping them hopefully see the weight and the danger that they are in. There's not a lot of good things, if anything, said good about this church. They are in a dangerous spot, and we need to recognize that in a church at this time that had plenty of wealth, that had, pl that had plenty of material possessions, that had all the reason to rely on the stuff and the things instead of Jesus because they weren't in need, because they didn't have the necessity to rely on Christ we, in our culture today, are dangerously close to looking just like this church. Because the reality is, is that most of us, if not all of us, drove here today. Most of us, if not all of us, live in a house or an apartment or some building with a roof over our head. And maybe it wasn't always like that, but as we sit in our current context and where we are at, we live in a world where it is incredibly easy to trust and rely on things and created things instead of God. Because when things get tough, then we go to the Lord. But when things are going well and when we prosper, we say, thank you for the blessings, thank you for the stuff. And we begin to focus on those things. We begin to focus on our income and promotions. We begin to focus on the relationships around us. And we begin to focus on all of the things except Jesus. It is so easy to lose sight of the King of Kings. It shouldn't be. But because of the abundance that we have. And you might think, you don't know my situation, church. In our context, most of us, if not all of us, have an abundance. We must 
not misunderstand our spiritual condition before the Lord. We must not miss what it means to truly be rich, to truly be prosperous, because it has nothing to do with the things. It has nothing to do with the size of our house, or how updated our phone is, or the kind of car that we drive. It has nothing to do with how many friendships we have. It has nothing to do with any of those things. To be rich and prosperous is to know and be known by God. That is what it means to be prosperous, and this church has departed from that. And so Jesus lays it out before him. He says, here's where you're at. Here's the dire situation. Here's how endangered you are. And he gives them a solution. He gives them, this is what you need to do. And when we look at the solution in verses 18 through 20, including 21, 18 through 21, what we begin to see is that in verse 19, there's actually a link that continues to help us show, help us see that as Jesus addresses the church in verse 19, the Lord says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Repent. The reality is, is that, yes, this church is in a very dire situation, but they are still his church. Amen. It can, it, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. We might look upon the church of Laodicea and go, man, how, how is it that you're still his church? How is your lampstand still there? How has the Lord not spit you out of his mouth yet? But the Lord, the fact that the Lord brings reproof and discipline is a demonstration that they are still his children. So hear the reproof and hear the discipline. In verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. So that you may be rich and white garments and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What I find incredibly interesting is that I'd expect this, I counsel you to actually come across as you need to do this. To come across as a command. But instead, it says, I counsel you. And there's a level of gentleness about that. It's almost a matter of fact the way it's stated, but it still has less of an impact. In other words, if you want to get right with me, here's what you need to do. The first thing he says is to purchase from him gold refined by fire. This is not physical gold. Physical gold, they had. They had it in abundance. He's not asking them to buy physical gold. Instead, he's asking them to buy from him the light and knowledge of the gospel of grace. He's asking them to go to him so that they might have fervent love for Christ, so they might have a strong faith in him. He's asking them to buy gold so that they might understand the unsearchable riches and satisfaction of knowing God and being known by God. That is what he's calling this church to buy from him. Not gold, physical gold, but to know God. Because to know God and to be known by God is the most precious thing in all of creation. There is nothing better than knowing God and being known by him. Because you can have all of the abundance of the world, and if you know God and someone said, you need to trade all of your things for Jesus, then it should not be a question. Take all of it if it means I gain Christ. Buy from him the riches and the beauty and the satisfaction of knowing God. He says buy white garments to cover their nakedness and their shame. Their nakedness is their their tarnished hearts because of their sin. The shame of their idolatry of chasing after their prophets. their, Their income, their finances. And these garments that they purchase from him, these garments are the righteousness of Christ. Because what we have instead is filthy rags. And when we purchase garments from Christ, the white demonstrates the purity, demonstrates that this is the righteousness of Christ. And when you have purchased the white garments and you stand before the king, instead of seeing your sin, instead of seeing your idolatry, instead of seeing your shortcomings, instead of seeing... All of your mistakes, which I'm sure if we begin to think about our mistakes, they begin to pile up higher and higher and higher. Jesus says, no, purchase for me white garments. And when you have those, 
all that sin, all that wretched despising of God, all the things you did against him to go contrary to his word is gone in what is seen instead as the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is not your works. It is not your doing. It is his righteousness, his good works. And he places it upon you. And when you have the righteousness of, righteousness of Christ, you are made holy and blameless. You have joy beyond measure because you have been forgiven. You, me, as a sinner, with no hope, Jesus says, no, I'll give you my perfect righteousness. Amen. He then says, by salve to anoint your eyes so that you might see. Their eyes had grown dull. <clears throat> They had difficulty seeing their Savior. They had difficulty understanding the Word of God. They had difficulty and struggled to understand the gospel and what it meant. And so because they had not the eyes to see, they chased after the other things. And they thought there was prosperity in the blessings instead of the blesser. And so Jesus says, no, anoint your eyes. With the medication that you claim to <laughs> produce, take the medication from me. To anoint your eyes so that you might see the riches of the gospel, so you might drink in the word of God, so that you might find your joy and foundation in Christ once again, and not in all the other things. And if we were to culminate the gold and the garments and the, uh, the ointment for eyes, we put all these things together. What is Jesus offering this church so that they can have, be brought back to him? He's simply offering Jesus. He's offering himself. He's not giving them a better strategy. He's not telling them to rework their, their vision statement and their goals as a church. He's not telling them to have more volunteers, to have better programs. He's not telling them to show up to church more often. He's telling them, do you love me? Will you cling to me? Will you look to Christ in all things? Will you deny all of the prosperous blessings that you've been given, that you've used to Form some kind of false spirituality, and will you deny those things and cling to Christ? That is what he's calling this church to do. Because when you cling to Christ, when everything that you have is built upon Christ, and it is for Christ, and it is through Christ, then the other stuff will follow. And he says, purchase from me. And at first that might be kind of striking because you might think, what on earth could I bring to the King of Kings? What is it that I have of any, anything that's even close to the value of the gold and the garments and the eye, and the eye ointment that Christ offers? The answer is nothing. You have nothing to offer. There's no currency. There's nothing you can trade. Nothing you can gamble to give him. There's nothing you can bring to the table. But Isaiah 55, 1-3 gives us this picture. Isaiah 55, 1-3 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that, which, uh, for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food, and climb your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you with an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, pure love for David. Isaiah saw it. When Jesus says, come purchase for me, he's not telling you to bring currency. He's not telling you to bring something that you have to offer, because the reality is that the only thing we have to offer is the rags that we're clothed in and the sin that we commit. We have nothing to bring to the king of kings. Yet Jesus says, come by without price. Simply cry out to God, Lord, give me the gold refined by fire. Give me garments of white. Make me, uh, give me eyes to see. And the reality is that there's nothing for us to pay. There's no, nothing for us to, no, no paycheck for us to submit to him. There's nothing that we have to bring because Jesus already paid for it in full. Amen. Because when Jesus lived, he lived a perfectly righteous life. No sin. He was the perfect Lamb of God. And yet on the cross, the entirety of God's wrath, His eternal wrath against sin, the wrath that we deserve for sinning against God, was poured on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. So that on the cross, He bore your entire debt. Amen. 
everything you owe to God, every ounce, every penny, every single thing that you have done or will do against God, Jesus bore it on the cross. So that when we draw near to him, and we say, Lord, please, I don't have anything to offer. I don't have money. I don't have, my life is, is completely worthless. I don't have anything to bring to you. He says, I paid for it already. Amen. Take the gold. Take these garments. Take the outside eye salve so that you might see. Be made righteous before the king of kings and know the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paid for. And Jesus brings this to the church in Laodicea and he says, Come back. You've gone astray. You've gone your own way. You've done the things you wanted. You're, you're, you need to return to Christ. Will you return to your king or not? We get to verse 20. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Remember, this is addressed to a church. These are individuals who are hopefully born again. Within the context, they are loved by God, they are born again, but there is no doubt that within that church and many churches, there are those who have worked their way in, who have found their way onto or as members of the church, yet they are dead in their sin. And so we have to understand this verse in light of both of those contexts. First and foremost, for those that were in the church that were truly born again but had gone astray, that had gone their own way, the knocking, I'm firmly convinced, is this letter. And sometimes when we think of the knocking, we think of like a... No. This is not soft. This reprove and rebuke from the Lord is not gentle. The Lord is banging on the door. Wake up! You've gone so far from me. Will you come back? Will you return to the grace of God? He's calling upon them to wake up, to wake up from the stupor that they've been in, to not fall into the ways that they used to, but instead to return to Christ. And for those who hear the call of the Lord, for those who hear him knocking, who read this letter and who feel the weight of conviction from the Spirit, they go, Lord, Please come back in. For those that hear him, they open the door. And he comes in and he dines with them. And, and to have someone come into your home, especially within this culture, to dine with them is a tremendous act of, of closeness and intimacy. Because church, we don't serve a God that's way off in the distance. We don't serve a God that, that created the world and then is far removed from everything. No, he walks with us. He lives inside of us. In this church, he's saying, I want to come in and eat with you. Will you come back? There are those undoubtedly who are within the church who are dead in their sins, who do not know Christ. And for them, it's the same thing. The knocking is the work of the Spirit through the working of this letter for them to hear, to be convicted of their sin, to realize while the others maybe have known Christ and have wandered away, those that don't know him yet are those that have never put their faith and trust in Christ. And the scary part is they probably look just like the other Christians. So they thought that they were good. They thought that they had the same spirituality as the rest of the church. Because the church was so lost, it's hard to tell the difference. And so when they read this letter and their eyes are opened and they hear the call of Christ and they say, I'm dead. I have no hope. And they open the door and Jesus gives them the life that they never had. And he dines with them, just like he does those in the rest of the church. So ask yourself the question, are you here this morning as someone who has gone astray? Are you here this morning? And maybe it's not to the degree of the Laodicean church. Maybe you're not as lost or as far away as the church, as the Christians in Laodicea, but have you gone your own way? Have you decided, well, I don't really need to be here on Sundays because it's not that important. I have other things to do. Have you decided, well, I don't really necessarily need to read my Bible because pastor reads it on Sunday and I can... You know, suffice with just a little bit here and there. Have you gone astray and thought, well, I'll share the gospel with that person tomorrow because today is just not the right day? Have you trusted in your job more than Christ? 
Have you been more anxious about winning your neighbor for Jesus, or have you been more anxious about who's going to be in the White House in a few weeks? Where is your trust? Is it in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, or is it in anything else? Maybe you're here and you have been among the church for as long as you can remember. Maybe you've been going to church your entire life, or maybe you've been going to church for only a few weeks, it doesn't matter, but you've never truly believed in Christ. You look like the other Christians, but you're not one of them, because inside the Lord sees that you're dead. You're lukewarm, and he is going to spit you out. If this is you, and the Lord is calling, repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ. There is nothing more. There's nothing better than Jesus. It is only him. There's nothing that can satisfy. There's nothing that can build you up other than faith and trust in Christ. And for those in the church of Laodicea, and for all Christians, for those that are comforts, for those who repent and believe in Christ, for those who are found within fellowship of him, verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down on my father's throne. Um, sat down with my father on his throne. Time and time again in these letters, we have seen radical, complete, and full fellowship with Christ. And here we see that we're not just children of God, we are co-heirs with Christ. What other little G God invites those who are completely rebellious against them to be given forgiveness at his own expense? And then not only offers them forgiveness at his, at, his own, at his own expense, but then proceeds to say, as you conquer, as I have conquered, you can sit down with me on my throne. There is no other God that does this. Only the King of kings and Lord of lords, only Jesus Christ, only God the Father does this. The God we serve is far above anything and everything else. And he is offering us the fullest what it means to be known by God and to know Him. As with the other verses, the other passages, he ends with, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to take a moment. Each church, Ephesus, they had lost their first love. Smyrna endured persecution but remained faithful. Pergamum was faithful before the throne of Satan, yet they followed the false teachings of Balaam, Thyatira. Their latter work succeeded the first, but they tolerated that woman Jezebel, that false teacher. And Sardis, they appeared to be alive, but they were dead, except for a few names. Philadelphia had little power, yet they were used powerfully by the Lord to witness to those who claimed to be Jews, but lied. And in Laodicea, they chased idols. They were useless as lukewarm water. They were on the verge of being spit out of the Lord's mouth. Does any of this resonate? Does any of this stick? Does the Lord call upon you in any way in any of these portions of the church and said, Lord, I look just like the church in Ephesus. I look just like the church in Pergamum or the church in Sardis or the church in Laodicea. Is there any point where we have gone through this series and you've thought, I don't know if I'm in a good spot or not. And if there has been absolutely nothing in this series that has stuck with you, not the encouragement of the Lord and not the reproof that the Lord gives to the church, if there is nothing that has stuck with you, then I have been an inadequate preacher for your heart is hard. And both of those are terrifying. Christ has called these churches, and, then, and just like he's called these churches, he's called all of his church to remain faithful, to be uncompromising, to be strong and powerful witness for the gospel of grace, to stand firm in a wicked day, to be opposed to evil regardless of any hint of good that evil might have, to be opposed to all evil, and most importantly, for these churches to see Jesus. Do you see Jesus? Do you need to go to the Lord and repent? I saved the last part, which is actually in the first verse. In verse 14, at the end, it says, the beginning of God's creation. Here's why that is so important.
because the Lord calls us to be new creations. He calls us to be born again. And Jesus is not the first created thing. He has always existed. But at his death and resurrection, he is the first of the new creation. He is the inauguration of the kingdom of God. And because he has inaugurated the kingdom in for all who put their faith and trust in Christ, you are a new creation. You are made brand new. The old you has passed away. The new has come. And because he has made a new creation for those that are found in Christ, the question is, are you a part of that new creation? Are you a part of Christ? Is he your king? Is he your everything? Do you see how beautiful he is? Do you see how lovely he is? Do you, have you tasted of his grace and his love and said, Lord, I don't want the stuff. I don't want my old life, my sin that left me empty. I want Jesus instead. Is that you? And if that's not you, then repent and put your faith and trust in Christ. For all else falls short of the glory of God. All things are worthless compared to knowing him. And if you do know him, have you gone astray in any capacity? Whether it is as extreme as the church of Laodicea, or as mild as you simply forgot to read your Bible once this week. Have you gone astray? And if you have, have you compromised in some way? Have you, have you chased after idols? Have you done anything that would compromise your faith in Christ? And if that's you, then repent of that. Turn away from it. Say, no, I don't want that thing. Change your mind about it. Instead, buy gold from the King of Kings. Buy garments from him. Buy salt to anoint your eyes. And again, this is without money. Simply cry out to God and ask him to give it to you. We must be a church that has ears to hear. Not just in this series, but in every day, every week after this, we have to have ears to hear what the King is doing. How he is changing us and molding us and building us up. So, he who has ears to hear, let, this, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's close in prayer.